Socially Radical. Socially Radical. Socially Radical. Socially Radical. Socially radical. Socially radical. Guitarist.
Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Socially Radical Guitarist. Um, the song you heard just now was Schema from Circa Survive in their album Decensus, which came out in 2014. So, um, yeah, just to do the regular disclaimer, anything that I say or that my whole say or the respective opinions of the host and the guest, uh, they have nothing to do with uh, Radio Waterloo, any of its subsidiaries or any of its affiliates. So, no, you cannot sue public radio over this program. Um, yes, and also um, the opinions of the host and the guests are the respective opinions of the host and the guests only and have nothing to do with the African and Caribbean Inclusion Center, even though they are sponsoring this show. So, no, don't sue the nonprofit either. Support the nonprofit. Make sure to go to the site, ASIC Canada. .ca and support as much as you can uh, to help give meaningful change to the refugee immigrant newcomer system in Canada. Uh, don't just leave it as it is. And don't sue the nonprofit either. So, yes. Now, getting into um, this song. Um, it's, a good, it's a good indie song. And there's a lot of depth to it because... Um, the way Flavor is added with the guitar is very interesting. It's the only guitar that's really filling the space. So, there are a lot of beautiful and interesting lines going through this music. Um, from the very beginning. <laughs> that large bend as he's using the guitar as a percussive instrument so he plays on the downbeat the one stroke on the downbeat while uh, muting the strings and it's very interesting and then um, as the verse goes you'll hear um, a guitar kind of emphasizing a theme which will um, resonate throughout the whole song. throughout the whole song and it's a very good way of um yeah providing the depth um it doesn't clash with the lyrics uh or the vocals um interesting lot because um anthony he sings at a very high pitch so when he's singing those very high notes and um the guitar is basically at a mid mid rate. They don't clash with each other. So, um, the guitar, as you can see, is very accustomed to. Oh wait. Like you can tell, there's a lot of chemistry between the musicians. They're very accustomed to each other. Um, and that's apparent even when they're doing a recording. Um, and. The guitar doesn't end up having to do much to fill the space when like you're just hearing the chords in the background and when the bridge comes And 
it's very seamless because that line's very small, very short, not very complex, but it's very carefully chosen so that when he goes back to the chorus, um, the whole transition ends up making sense. Just like that. Um, yeah, like Circa Survive, um, they went through an independent label with this album, Desenses. Um, and this album, you know, particularly, you'll find interesting things where some of their songs have a lot of views. I mean, a lot of listens. But the monthly listens are don't match the total listens of certain songs. I feel like some songs are in popular playlists, but the album and the band as a whole in, in Spotify isn't really getting the appreciation and the do that it should. Um, especially considering the fact that um, indie music is generally very you know popular. Um, you know, depending on which indie band, um, throughout, um, like North America, um, you'll like, it's, you know, it's kind of a recurring theme through the show where the, the bourgeoisie has made a conscious effort to, you know, suppress, um, you know, proletarian music that portrays, you know, Western proletarian culture. That they have their own bourgeois culture they want to propagate. And it's really an extension of European bourgeois culture. Which is, you know, it's about, um, you know, it e emphasizes um, going along with the lines of production making sure the music is mass produced, make sure it has a convenient message that doesn't uh, inadvertently radicalize the masses. Um, like music that's carefully thought out like this, um, you'll find it suppressed in certain ways. And, um, you know, there are some indie bands that do make it because they've kept everything simple and they haven't put a lot of soul into the music not as much as some others um or um you know i've heard a rumor actually um you know from my brother who's in the industry in the u.s that actually there's an initiation process with the exacts now this is just all conjecture it's not like um i have any solid evidence for any of this it's just my brother's word but um, the, the, the rumor is that um, the reason why um, you'll see couples and why they're crying at the Grammys um, after, you know, making it is because there was initiation process with the execs. There, there would be a one night, you know, before, um, you know, they're set to be announced for the Grammys of uh, the Grammys and to get an award or be nominated. And um, the wife would be taken away into another room with one of the execs. And um, the husband would, of course, you know, try to follow, but he'd be told to sit down and relax while they're in the other room. And um, yes, this is just a rumor, but if you are aware of the character of the bourgeoisie and you're aware of the fact that there are parties with non-disclosure agreements among celebrities for a reason, everything's supposed to be blocked off. There are not supposed to be any cameras. Um, 
nobody's allowed to know what's going on behind the scenes. And, of course, you see the conduct of the bourgeoisie and how they, they govern the United States and how they um, export democracy abroad, so-called democracy, when, in fact, what they're really doing is brutalizing uh, the defiant and the people seeking independence and freedom. Um, then it does somewhat make sense. Um, you'll hear like historical um, portrayals of empire and how there'd be a lot of decadence. Caligula, of course, he would... Um, you know, he would toy with with the with the wives of you know generals and officers right in front of them at parties, and a sign of cultural degeneration is to see that the decadence in the leadership. Um, you'll see um, AOC, for example, going to a Met Gala while calling herself a champion of the people. She goes around and address and uh you know address for what's usually a thirty thousand dollar ticket um and the the man behind the the help lifting her her dress uh is forced to wear a mask and and she isn't wearing a mask of course um the the help is hispanic most of the help is hispanic and black and the majority of the the patrons without the masks, um, you know, the patrons, not the peasants, are 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 white, M largely white, or you know, um, white with a Latin American background, and y you see that. You see um, the people that you're supposed to idolize, the people that we're supposed to look up to, that we're supposed to worship um, in society, the you know the celebrities, the ones that made it, that do the, the great thing. You'll see a lot of signs of decadence, infidelity with wives, infidelity with husbands, um, reckless endangerment behind the scenes, a lot of drug abuse, a lot of you know social issues among them and these things should seriously make you question the society but many people don't they just eat up the entertainment articles and keep reading through um and they don't question the politicians getting involved in that you know taking pictures on time magazine for example or um, even, you know, Justin Trudeau and then make the circulating rumors about how um, Donald Trump's wife was looking at Justin Trudeau a certain way and, you know, things like that. Um, yeah, society is very de decadent. And, um, yeah, another un unfortunate indication of that is that people aren't thinking of mobilizing to build independent movements. They're not thinking hard enough about imperialism. Um, and that's what my guest is going to highlight soon as well. Um, Drew Garvey, he's the, um, he's a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Canada, and he was a candidate uh, for the Toronto Renforth riding where, um, Christia Freeland is sitting on the Liberal Party. Um, what what she's done um, would be unacceptable from a human standpoint. Um, but she was reelected. Um, part of it might have to do with the fact that the first past the post system kind of incentivizes strategic voting. It's fundamentally anti democratic. But. Um, also, you kind of see that the party itself 
isn't organized well enough to be able to, um, well, isn't large enough to be able to compete in all writings. And that's kind of an indication of consciousness as well. Um, but, you know, Drew, being an actual candidate, will be able to talk about what was going on um, directly as he was running better than I can. And he's he's had a lot of experience. He's been, you know, socially conscious for a long time. Uh, so look forward to hearing from him. And uh, look forward to hearing from another band that was kind of set to the wayside, not really given its due either, um, the contortionist. Um, it's kind of a similar kind of music, but it was really more progressive rock, not necessarily indie rock. Um, they do a lot of progressive stuff, a lot of fusion stuff, and um, this next track is more in line with what I just played. It's it's kind of like an indie track. Um, um, there's a lot going on, a lot of uh, technical stuff going on um, with with all of the musicians. Um, but it's um, a very good emotional song, you know, talking about, um, you know, relationships w when they go bad and, um, you know, someone desperately trying to fix it. Uh, and I wish this uh, song would have gotten more, you know, appreciation than it did um, after it was released, but it is what it is. That's the state of um, cultural consciousness, musical consciousness, and social consciousness in the society. And... Uh, I hope maybe I play this song, other people have the courage to play this, and eventually, hopefully, either pre-revolution or post-revolution, bands like The Contortionist end up getting their due. So uh, look forward to the next song coming up, um, Early Grave by uh, The Contortionist from the album Our Bones. It was released in 2019. And uh, look forward to our guest, uh, Drew Garvey. So stay tuned. We'll have the intermission and uh, we'll be right back. Just like you're saying 
Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, welcome back, you know, to the political segment of Socially Radical Guitars. Song you heard just now was um, the Contortionist's Early Grave. So um, very emotional, slow moving, but there's a lot of stuff going on in the music. It's very creative musicians. Um, I particularly like that song when I'm in a somber mood. So um, I'm going to be introducing the guest. The guest is Drew Garvey. Uh, he's a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Canada, and he was also a candidate for the 2021 elections. So hi, hi Drew. How are you doing? Hi. I'm good, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, so um, just a little bit of an intro. How long have you been running as a candidate for the Communist Party of Canada? Why have you chosen to run as a communist? And uh, what changes have you seen in the uh, electorate since you first began running? Um, well, yeah, I, uh, my first election was when I was in my very early 20s in 2007. Uh, for a provincial election <clears throat> and then I've, I've run in every federal and provincial election since then um, and I forget how many that is but I think that's about five federal and, and about three provincial give or take maybe a couple um, so and and the first I should say the first few were in Guelph um, where I was a, a student and then working for a few years um, so I have you know my, my recent experience in Toronto is a little different in the big city for example big city people are just more prone to like not want to talk to you and uh, not take your flyer and stuff, no matter what. <laughs> There's some differences. Uh, but uh, no, I would say that since 2007, especially, especially amongst younger people, a lot of the um, uh, hangovers from the Cold War about hearing the hearing the word communist um, has lifted quite a bit. Um, you know, still, there's a lot. There's a lot of anti communism in the in the air. I mean, we're next door to the United States. Um, and also this new stuff with, you know, Chinese communists under your bed and Trudeau is an agent of Chinese communism. And uh, the, vi you know, the virus is a, is both a hoax and, and a communist conspiracy and stuff like this. Th that kind of stuff is new. So there's like, I'd say a, a, like a kind of hardened minority of anti-communism, but in general, people are more and more seeing the limits of capitalism and the limits of democracy uh, inside a capitalist uh, system. Uh, so, you know, you can see that even from the, the voter turnout and the just total lack of inspiration and being generally pissed off with the, the options on the ballot. Um, I think that kind of characterizes this election in particular. So that brings me to your, your question about why we, want, we run. I mean, we run uh, not necessarily to get elected, although it would be good to have some communists in the House of Commons to uh, to be a, a voice for working people, a more consistent voice than what we have now. But um, we run in order to talk to people. For better or worth, worse, working people are more receptive to talking about politics during election time. And that's just the way of the world right now. So we want to use that to uh, take advantage of it, get into debates, talk to people on the doorstep in the street, and um, talk about big ideas, including putting socialism on the uh, on people's radar. So uh, more or less, that's why we do it. Yeah, I think those are your three questions. Does that cover it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that does cover it. Um, so uh, like I was looking around social media, I noticed uh, there, are, there are a lot of obstacles, particularly in Toronto, to the Communist Party of Canada getting a platform on the debate stage with the other candidates. I know... Um, uh, definitely, uh, Jennifer Moxon, Moxie, she seemed to have an issue getting on the debate stage. Was that the case for you as well? And uh, what will be the tactic to get on the debate stage for future elections? Yeah, so, you know, we usually, we usually, it's not new that we have to fight to get into the debates. Um, you know, quite frankly, people don't know because of I would say mainly because of the corporate media and um, the elector the first past the post electoral system it's not just our party that's uh, shut out of you know the evening news or whatever it's a lot of Canada has I don't know close to 20 around 20 parties and people think of you know can name maybe four or five um, so in a lot of places the people putting together debates don't just want to exclude the smaller parties um, 
and that's been that's been longstanding, and we fought to to be included. Uh, usually, when they hear our platform, um, they realize that we're serious. You know, we're we're not just uh, like the rhinoceros party or something like that that um, is quite happy to be a joke. That's their whole uh, that's their whole shtick. Uh, we do take politics seriously, and we have something to offer uh, these debates and the public uh, the public discussion in general that other parties aren't aren't putting forward and that's a clear class perspective. Um, so, you know, just my experience in Guelph, I was one of the first candidates that we'd run in Guelph for a while and we slowly would fight each year to get on more debates. And then by the end we would get more, we, we got more invitations because people would, would hear from us and we would pressure certain debate organizers and whatnot. So in Toronto, Jen, uh, Jen was our first candidate in Beaches East York for, for a number of years, which is a good thing. Um, but I think some debate organizers were were um, particularly picky. I should also say that part, parts of beaches, East York are, the Southern part is probably one of the most affluent er areas in, in Toronto. It's a very mixed mixed riding. Um, so, you know, for example, in Guelph, I never got invited by the Chamber of Commerce. Surprise, surprise. Um, and then in, in my riding this time, as Christia Freeland has gotten uh, bigger and bigger in terms of the government, she feels the need to show up to less and less debates. So I was invited to one public all candidates event this time and Christy Freeland wasn't there, um, which is too bad. Often the Tories don't show up at all, but including some high profile liberals don't bother to go to much either. Uh, and that, that for the reason, the reason for that is um, uh, their thinking is that, well, I'm already a name brand. People know, people know me and I might say something stupid. So uh, I don't want to be caught on video saying something stupid and that that could make the evening news. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. You know, people have a right to hear um, from all the candidates in their writings and make an informed decision. And uh, a lot of places, they'll, they'll say it's an all candidates meeting and it won't include all candidates. So our, our particular tactic for that is that we show up in person, uh, hand out leaflets to the audience and say, hey, we're being undemocratically excluded. This is an all candidates debate and we're also on the ballot. We're a registered political party, just like everybody else. We have the right to be heard. Um, and then we typically typically stand up in the front of the room and say, uh, listen, everybody, I'm right here. Look, there's an empty seat up there. The Tory didn't show up because they never do. Wouldn't it be great if, if the event organizers changed their mind and included me in the debate? And about 50% of the time that works. <laughs> um, but of course, during a pandemic election, when all these events are online, that was not possible. So I look forward to the next election. I mean... I really hope we don't have another pandemic election and that we'll be able to, to use those kind of tactics to continue to expand, um, you know, the fact to, to just to expand democracy in these kind of debates. And I, I do think all candidates debates are important, um, although the, the trend is moving more and more in the American style of big money in elections, all ad campaigns, all about the leaders, not about the local candidates. Uh, we should try and resist that and bring it back to more to the local candidates and those kind of community debates because there is, I'm, I'm, I'm not singing the virtues of bourgeois democracy 40 years ago or whatever, but it is getting worse in terms of big money. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's definitely something to think about. Um, uh, talking about the party itself, um, uh, it looks like the Communist Party was only available as an option in maybe about 26 of the 33 or so ridings across Canada. And that might have impacted the decision of would-be voters. Why was the party spread so thin? Uh, is there a strategy to expand the reach of the party for following elections? Uh, yes, so I mean, we've been a, we've ran, you know, in a, in, you know, there's three, more than 300 ridings across the country. We ran in a small minority of, of uh, of writings, I think for a long time. For, we're talking like seventy years here, um, but we're trying to we're trying to build that m more. But we we also want to resist, you know, paper can what we call paper candidates, which is just having somebody on the ballot and not having a campaign around them. Which some of the big parties do, by the way. Like the NDP will put a lot of resources, signs, and leaflets into a riding that they think they have a chance of winning, but in some other ridings, they don't even bother printing signs or leaflets, right? Um, so if our goal is to like talk to people and stuff like that, we want to 
we want to have as a strong a campaign as we can on the ground. So it's not all about increasing numbers, but absolutely we do need to increase numbers um, to because people just see it as a uh, well, at the end of the day, it's first past the post system. If we're not polling at a certain level across the country, then you have a very limited chance of winning a particular riding. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, if we are going to elect somebody, we need to move in that direction. But I will say on the, the results for the party, um, and again, it's not, you know, it, we tell people to vote communist to send the clearest message that fundamental change is needed in the country um, and to put, to build the movement towards socialism. But this is a long, you gotta have a long-term vision to agree to do that, right? I mean, there is something to be said in the first past the post system that like limits people's imagination to strategic voting, right? I gotta vote liberal to keep the Tory out if you're in, a, in that form of a, like, and all the writings are always narrowed down to two candidates, right? Uh, in that in this system, or you got to vote uh, NDP to um, to keep the liberal out in the case of some Toronto ridings um, or big city ridings. So, yeah, I mean, the votes for us is uh, is always kind of artificially low. I think compared to the people that we hear like our platform and agree with us, like it's it's not uncommon, Christian, to hear people say like, "Well, I'm not going to vote for you." but I would like to join your party, which is kind of, um, you know, totally backwards. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we have been slowly increasing our votes. This one was just in the riding that I ran in, we got a got hundred more votes than we did uh, last time. And this was the biggest vote uh, for us since the year 2000, which was a time we ran 52 candidates. Uh, and that was a decision because we were, um, under the gun, the federal government was trying to, well, had brought in legislation to say that if you don't run more than 50 candidates, you're not considered a political party. So in that election, we had a lot of paper candidates because that was a strategic decision at that time. Um, and we got, uh, you know, around the same number of, of votes as we did when we had double the amount of candidates in that election. And we got the highest per candidate vote since 1974. Um, so I know we're talking about small numbers and uh, we're in the end days of capitalism here and we need to grow quickly because of the political situation we're in. But um, yeah, for, for having 26 campaigns across the country, I think we did, we did make an impact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> definitely uh, was a tough election. Um, you know, interestingly enough, there are um, a lot of permanent residents, refugees that can't vote that still can technically join the party. Something to think about. Um, um, so th that that is a tough election. It is a tough election. So is is there a silver lining, like um, when you're looking at growth and and uh, other aspects of the party and its performance? Uh, well, let's talk quickly about the overall election outcome because I think that is <laughs> that's a silver lining. Um, I, I do think that although this election was particularly terrible with kind of how uninspiring and quite frankly boring it was, um, just with in terms of the actual election debate, I mean, you had, well, you had the, the Liberal Party offering childcare, not much else, and also saying like, well, you, you don't want the Tories because uh, we know that they're anti-vaxxers and uh, ultra-right, tied to the ultra-right, which is true. Um, and then you had the Tories being like, no, 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 we're not. That's basically it. And, uh, and then you had the NDP saying, well, tax the rich, which is refreshing a little bit, I have to say, because they haven't said that in quite a long time. But when you scratch the surface, their policies were not much different than the Liberal Party. I mean, in, 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 in terms of just their, their uh, income tax proposals, for example, not that much different than the Liberal Party. And uh, they're uh, expanding... Um, healthcare to include dental and eye care and stuff like that. That was all means tested, which, you know, basically means liberal part, classic neoliberal scheme, which the liberal party is, um, is always putting forward, you know, like all these loopholes in this new social program that they're putting forward. Um, and then of course you had the people's party, which was there, well, I guess there was nothing boring about the people's party campaign actually, but it was actually very terrifying uh, what they were able to accomplish this election. And they are a, a fascist and, and racist um, outfit here. 
or at least they have many, many fascists inside and, and their pro platform is definitely racist and xenophobic. Um, and they were, they made a lot of hay in terms of organizing the uh, anti-vaxxer, anti-passport, um, anti-lockdown stuff. Uh, so they, they got 800,000 votes across the country, which is uh, not good. Uh, but the silver lining going back to it is that at the end of the day, okay, terrible election, but at the end of the day, in terms of all the possible realistic outcomes, and uh, communist majority was not a possible realistic outcome. Sorry, Christian. Um, but uh, a liberal minority does mean that, uh, you know, and there's already all this push from the business community to, to get the liberals to cancel, con continue canceling CERB, you know, like all this stuff, like, oh, there's no, there's a labor shortage and people are getting lazy and all this crap. And uh, there's going to be a real push towards austerity now. Um, and that's going to be more difficult for the liberals to, to carry out because they've got a minority government. So if they do things that are really unpopular, which austerity, you know, they, they, they usually like doing things that are really unpopular when they have majority governments. And if working people can get organized and if, um, you know, different movements can come together, the, the labor movement, um, anti-racist movements, indigenous sovereignty, sovereignty movements, the climate movement, which has a big march today, by the way, if people can come together and say no, we're not going to take it, and we demand a different, um, a different way forward, then the liberals will be unable to carry out their agenda, which uh, is not the one they ran on. But if you look at the past, there's plenty of instances of the liberals running to the left, um, you know, to the center left, and then moving in a center right or right wing direction. So that's what needs to be blocked right now. So that's the silver lining. Um, and then the, the silver lining for the party, I think, is that, you know, we are growing. We've, we've had about a 50% increase in membership in the last year or so. Um, and it was a chance for a lot of new people to get together, just get basic experiences, handing out flyers, working together, getting to know each other. Like a lot of, there's been a lot of Zoom meetings over the last year. Um, so it was a real chance to kind of consolidate that growth. Um, and we'll have a lot more opportunities where we're going to be talking about uh, a campaign for housing uh, in the in the province of Ontario. So this has been a major issue during the election and will be beyond because there was really no solutions put forward in the election. We got a campaign for mass construction of social housing, rent rollbacks. Um, um, so this will be a major campaign in Ontario leading up to the provincial election in the spring. And then we have municipal elections across Ontario next fall. And of course, all the ongoing struggles with uh, the Ford government, which is particularly reactionary and the, the new liberal government in in Ottawa so there'll be a lot uh, a lot more going forward that I think this um, the election although you know obviously we're a small party it did set us up for being able to to do more in terms of the extra parliamentary struggle immediately okay yeah so um I guess that is the silver lining um I guess that it does tie in a little bit to the next question but um what um what do you feel will be the impact towards like canada's relationship with the rest of the world like the foreign relations and with with this uh particular government i mean it's a minority government the same one that we had um you know since 2015 so just uh, well no 2019 i think yeah so just a a, a little bit more of an understanding of what uh, the what Canada's foreign policy is going to look like. What do you what do you foresee? I, I foresee more of the same, unless there's a serious intervention by uh, the peace movement, uh, which needs to be a, needs to be a lot stronger in this country. So, I mean, just 2015, Trudeau was elected in part on some on some uh, promises around foreign policy to to move in a peaceful direction. And that didn't happen at all. I mean, we saw pretty much right across the board entire continuity with the with the Harper government, um, and that included promises to NATO to raise the military budget by billions of dollars, the fighter jet purchases, which is you know tens of billions of dollars, the um, the new ship warship uh, ships are buying, which is tens of billions of more dollars there. So all these tens of billions of dollars could be going into social programs at a time where working people are 
um, you know, increasingly forced into poverty. And then you have the, the foreign policy. So Christian Freeland, who was um, the MP in the riding that I, that I ran in, she was the foreign minister for a few years and uh, she adopted a, a very aggressive foreign policy when it comes to Venezuela, for example. Canada was not just kind of tailing the US, but out there in front in terms of the intervention against Venezuela. And that included, you know, recognizing a totally fictitious president in the country, um, getting together this Lima group, which includes some of the worst human rights abusers in the, in the hemisphere, including Colombia, Brazil, Honduras, which is a coup government. Um, so, you know, just, just those kinds of examples, increasing sanctions against Nicaragua, Venezuela, Russia, selling arms to Saudi Arabia, and then being like, oh, maybe we should review it. Oh yeah, there's no problem there. Let's continue selling arms to Saudi Arabia uh, during a genocidal war in Yemen. So I could go on and on, but the, the point is that this government is not in any way a uh, pro-peace government. It is not in any way, um, you know, what Canada projects itself as, as a peacekeeping country, which has always been um, largely fictitious. But anyways, uh, we're moving in a more and more uh, aggressive direction in terms of being involvement in U.S. military uh, campaigns and including uh, on China. So this is particularly uh, concerning in a, in a world that seems to be uh, intent on moving into a new Cold War, or the West is intent on moving into a new Cold War. Uh, it looks like today the news is that Meng Wanzhou will, will be released. Um, and I don't really know what to say about that because I'm just reading the headlines. But I will say that it's been, what, two or three years now that Meng Wanzhou has been detained. And that was, you know, arresting a high profile Chinese uh, business leader at the behest of the U.S. government. You know, Trump just asked us to and, and we did it. Um, and, 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 and in Trump's words, that was to, for him to bargain economically with China. Our government says, no, no, that's not why we did it. But anyways, I might as well take Trump's word for it. Um, and uh, the result is increasingly strained tensions with China, which is one of our biggest uh, trading partners. So we need to move very quickly to a, a multilateral, uh, multilateral trade, mutually beneficial trade, and away from this kind of lockstep uh, approach with the US, which is all tied into the North American Free Trade Agreement. Or, or what is now the USMCA. We need to get out of these free trade agreements with the US. We need to get out of military pacts with the US, especially NATO. And we need to distance ourselves from US foreign policy. And that means a, an independent foreign policy of peace and disarmament. But that's not gonna happen without a major boost to peace forces in this country. Um, so we really do need to get organized to demand uh, better. So that includes divesting from war, divesting from the military and moving those those uh, that spending into uh, social services into the fight against climate change, for example. The military is a major polluter um, in terms of emitter uh, emissions of CO2s. So um, I think it is possible and we need to link these struggles together. But I wish I could say, you know, we were talking about silver linings and maybe the government won't, will, will be, have its arm behind its back, but that'll only happen if there is a peace movement that is fighting back in the country. Okay, so would you say that that's the next major plan for the party to initiate a peace movement? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we never stopped being involved in the in the peace movement, but it has dwindled, obviously. Um, and we're we're involved in the Canadian, or we work inside the Canadian Peace Congress with other people too. Um, so this is an anti anti imperialist organization across Canada. It's got a seventy year history. Um, and we, we want to organize more, more local chapters and do more mobilizing uh, with the Peace Congress, but also with the broader peace movement. So that includes pro-peace forces that aren't necessarily anti-imperialist, could improve in, in include faith-based organizations or organizations from whatever uh, immigrant group that the, that the uh, West is now targeting, because that changes from day to day. Um, but anyways, so uh, yeah, there's a lot to be done. And and we got to do it on a local level too. So I know there used to be a Guelph Peace Alliance and there used to be um, a KW Stop the War or something like that. Those are, those are the kind of organizations we need to, to revitalize and, and work on, including also solidarity with other countries. Um, uh, so not just peace in general, but, but solidarity with particular countries as well. Nice.
nice so um i think yeah great talk great talk um great explaining you know the state of the party and the plans for the future um it was sad that uh didn't get a seat but you know on to the next one keep trying right eventually you'll win um so yeah we're uh we're gonna be ending the interview and we're gonna be going out uh first with the outro and then with the song that drew picked what's the song drew yeah can i introduce it or give a little why i picked it yeah 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 definitely yeah so this is ali primera he was a uh a communist in Venezuela, a musician. I think he was trained in, or somewhat musically trained in, in East Germany too. Um, and then he died in an accident, I think in the seventies or eighties or no, it must've been the eighties. Um, so he's kind of a hero, although he wasn't around for the Bolivarian revolution, you know, when Chavez came to power, he is kind of still the soundtrack to it, you know? So this is dedicated to uh, Christian Freeland who um, has been instrumental in targeting Venezuela and uh, it's, you know, it's got a, it's mostly, mostly in Spanish, but it does have a good uh, Yankee go home, gringo go home uh, chorus in there. So. Uh, nothing like spite. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So we'll have the outro and then we'll have uh, Ali Primera's song. Um, yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a good one. See you next week.